grain filling. You know, grain filling is one of those things that really help us a lot in finishes, but you read about it and it can be pretty intimidating. And you know, for years and years it has been. There's just been such a array of products out there that you had to stand on one foot and do this and do that, with one finger in the ear, and that's just the way it's been. Here's a water. Solvent is typically uh, an oil base. Now, most of the time they're gonna tell you, in, in, and it's true, is to use a barrier coat, meaning like a half pound or a pound cut of shellac underneath the solvent base. There's a reason. That, this, stay, this stuff's got an oil in it. Actually, it's got mineral spirits, basically. And what it's gonna do is it kind of seals off the wood, so it doesn't wanna take your stains and whatever. But in this case, we're going straight to the wood because we're doing technique, and we'll talk about that. Now, when you're working, basically what this stuff is, is it's actually talc and some binder, something to make it stick. That's usually an oil. And it's kind of nasty, gooey stuff, kind of looks like it's about the consistency of mayonnaise, and that's about what you want. Somewhere between a heavy cream and a mayonnaise in either one. And essentially, the object of the game is to get this mess on here before... Now, here's a good tool. This is a little spreader. I buy these at the Auto Body Supply. Plastic, a plastic uh, putty knife works nice. And you want to work it in. Now, here's in this particular case, we're going right over bare wood and we're using a darker color. This is a mahogany color and a solvent base. Now the reason we're doing this is we want to accent our grain. And I want to get it off. Don't leave it gobbed on there. I like to work it in, wait till it kind of starts to haze off a little bit. That means it's starting to set. Now don't let it set too long. And don't try to do one, a whole piece, just do little sections. Once it's kind of glazed off, a good tool is just some old burlap. You can usually pick it up at a fabric store, whatever. Around here, you just go to the feed mill and get it. The burlap, because of the coarseness of it, will pull it off. Now here's a case where what it's done is going on the bare wood, this is stained and filled my pores, my grain. Now, over here is a section. Now I was going to tell you about this too. If, you, if it starts to get away from you on a solvent, take a cloth damp, a little bit of mineral spirits, and it'll help you get some of, some of it off. And let it dry. Let it dry good. Now, and big flat panels are easy. Once it's dried, okay, then you sand it back. That fills the pores. <laughs> This actually has a little bit of shellac under it. I would sand that further back. And you can see my scratches. I didn't do too good a job of sanding this before I showed it to you. But. Now, I'm going to tell you right straight up front, no ifs, no ands, no buts. Don't stop. I don't like, I don't like solvent based wood filler. Each to their own. I'm going to show you why. Here's a piece of mahogany that I took a water base, sealed it. Same difference. I sand it back.
Now I can take I can take a water base, I can take a water base stain, a water base dye. I can even take a what's called an NGR dye. I can take something like trans tint, the mix alls, this trans tint's a dye, mix alls a pigment. I can make it any color I want. Now you're going to see it in neutral and some of them will say clear. Now this is where you got to be careful and you want to check it. Depending upon how deep the pores are. Woods that have deep pores. Your oaks and your ashes are probably some of your deepest. Mahoganies. And particularly in a case like this Bombay. Now on the front of this Bombay this is actually what's it's actually a um, it's basically a quarter sawn wood in a ribbon cut. It does not have a lot of real heavy pores, but it does have some. On this side, because the way this side is shaped, this side in this area right in here is going to have an end grain as well as a flat grain. It's extremely porous. Now, this stuff also works on just simple end grain. But what the object of the game is, is to get a perfectly smooth surface where all the grain is filled. Now, if you look at this very careful, you can see the little white chalky marks where the grain has been filled. Pretty light. But, even though it looks chalky, Once I hit it, it will typically come back clear. If it's really heavy, it may not. But it's going to fill everything. And I get a nice smooth surface. The other thing I can do is just like we did with this piece of ash, I can tint it to a darker color. Again, using a water-based stain or anything that will mix with water-based. And I can add a little bit of diversity to my wood. Now all I did was I took a water base grain filler, I took a little bit of mix all and I made a little bit of a darker color and it's just highlighting my grain a little bit. Nothing major. Here's the other thing I like about water base. Here's a water based stain. Perfectly smooth, colored beautifully. Nobody can emphasize you do test panels. Some water-based stain or fillers, if you let them dry really long, they can kind of seal themselves off a little bit. 
by and large, water-based products don't seal the wood off as far as stains and fillers. They don't see, they're, they're a little more porous, so they take color better. Okay, oil base is oil base. It seals no matter what. That does a really nice job. I told you it's going to cut to the chase. I am, I'm getting there. In the case where you've got something like this molding, now these can be a little tough. Something as simple as a, as a coarse brush. If you're using a water base, use a synthetic. And this is where kind of a cheap brush comes in. Just work it in. Now, don't, you know, work it into the, work it in. Kind of making a mess. Once I've got it in, and I let it sit there a little bit, kind of glaze off, then I just simply take the burlap, wipe it back. Now, grain fillers put on predominantly after pretty much your final sand. Then after it's, you're done, you just come back and usually take your last grit of sandpaper and just kind of sand it back. In my case, a lot of times, if I'm going with something and I really want a smooth surface, I'm going to go up to a 220. I'll sand to 150, put my grain filler on, then I'll come back and I'll finish it off with some 220. On moldings and things like that, something like these little sanding pads and your appropriate grit really work nice for getting in. Just don't leave a pile of it on there, a big old globs or nothing. And you've got a glass smooth surface. Now, I know I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm gonna. Showing up on the market, and I'm coming, actually coming back refilming this to show it, because I did it. Uh, is a product called TimberMate. TimberMate comes to us from Australia. And if you don't speak Australian, here's something you need to know. They don't refer to wood as wood, it's called timber. And everybody knows what mate means in Australian. Haven't you watched Crocodile Dundee? Mate means friend. So if you put this into English the correct way, it'd be wood friend. All right, now common sense says, you know, be careful when you're sanding these, don't sand all your filler out. This is a product it's a silica base. What is that? Sand, basically. Now, here it is up here. It's just now showing up in this country. I know Woodcraft has got it. I don't know if they have it in the larger containers. Here's what I've got. I've got a tent base, is what it's called. And it kind of looks like a creamy bucket of sheetrock mud but it's not. It comes in a variety of different colors, all kinds. Here's a ebony, here's a Brazilian cherry, all kinds. Now some of the colors you kind of have to compare because they're still coloring a lot of them Australian woods, but they have comparison charts. Cool thing about this stuff is it, if it dries out, add a little water, you're good. Has pretty much an indefinite shelf life, so they say. I don't know. It's still new, but I can tell you this much. It's a wood filler, but you can thin it. I, I've just got a little bit of water in here. Mixes quick. I can thin it. Now in this case, the tent base is just gonna be a, a white neutral. Nothing to it. Mix it up. 
about the consistency of mayonnaise. Put it on there. That's what you just saw me using. Now this product does good too. I think, in my opinion, all of the water bases do very, very well. I've not... They're just so much easier to use than the solvents. You know, solvents just... These, you can stain over them. Again, the, 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 what you can do with it is almost endless. I can add tint, tones. Like I said, I can take a slug. A slug, that's, that's a technical measurement in woodworking. Actually, I would hope you would probably... be a little bit more accurate in your measurements. I can take the same stain or dye that I'm going to be using, make myself a filler. Just extremely easy. If I mix too much, I can simply add it right back to the container. Keep on getting it. This is a little soupy yet, but Mix is pretty good, but I'll go for it anyway. I got white on here from this brush. Don't you do that. Again, it's just kind of like putting mayonnaise on a piece of wood. Let it dry. If you don't feel like your grain's full or if you ac accidentally find something you got to sand and you sand it out, put a little more on there. Not that difficult. Sometimes I'll put it on and squeeze it off. Just fill in the grain. Kind of the way you like to do it, actually. You just want a natural grain filler. When that's dry, sand it back. You got a glass smooth surface. That's all it is. Okay, just you know, go easy with it. Remember, this stuff dries pretty fast. So, like I said, don't try to do some big whatever. You know, do a side like on this Bombay. I would do just this side. Then I might jump up here and do just this side. I'd be real easy doing these mold these moldings. Actually, I would do these because of the fluting, I would do these before I ever attached it. That's just me. Because trying to get down in here in these little notches and grooves can be kind of tough. The last thing we want to talk about with grain filling is, in any of it, don't work your finish, don't work your stains a whole lot. I told you, this stuff, water will mix with it. Common sense says if I put a water-based stain on here and I keep working it, I can soften and pull up some of my filler. Here's the trick. Take about a half pound cut of shellac, very thin, and either wipe it or spray a thin coat on there. Give it a quick scuff, just something like a little pad or whatever, then put your stain on top. It's really not going to seal off your penetration that much, but it can help keep you from picking up your filler. That's green filling in a nutshell, guys. It's not hard. The water bases, in my opinion, do the best, but I'm going to reiterate. That's just my opinion. But whatever you do, always test it first. Firewood is the place to learn how to finish. All right. Grain filling. Y'all like this? Kind of pretty, isn't it? It's a four-way book match with mahogany crotch. A little inlay, piece of mahogany out here. It's going to be a top to a, to a low boy. I'm going to route the edge. You know what's neat about this? It's a veneer. 
The other thing that's neat about it is the finish that's on it is pretty close to bulletproof. Now the reason I showed that to you is it's not super shiny. You ever seen this stuff? Sure you have. In a seafood restaurant, whatever, bars, you're going to see that pour on stuff. Real thick, shiny, super glossy. Doesn't have to be that way. Take a look at it. Here's three types. These two are epoxies. This is actually a polyester. Polyester is kind of like the hardener or the, the, the resin and that's in body filler. Tough finish. Epoxies are a little tougher. But what can we do with them? We know that they tell you you can just pour it over something and leave it. Do that. But we use it for a lot of different things. And I'm going to show you. Most of them are, each one, all of them will have a little different ratios and whatever that you use to mix. Really not difficult. It's a part A and a part B. Now I'm not going to mix a lot. But it's important to keep your ratios right. And don't do... Now, gloves, having some paper down is pretty important. Can be a little messy. Let's take a look at it. Now, one of the things with this product, all of them, is they dry slow. Now, before you get the idea that you can go out here and take a five minute epoxy and do this, you can't. Well, you can, but you're not going to be real happy. Now, clean up on this is acetone. Simple as that. All right. Now the reason for it is is that you can't use that five minute stuff is when you mix it, it's going to turn cloudy on you. And that's because air is going to get mixed in it. And the air doesn't have time to evaporate not evaporate, come up through it, get out of there. The bubbles don't have time to come up and pop and all the air get out of it before it hardens. That's the reason it doesn't dry clear. It dries opaque, cloudy. This stuff doesn't. And it's as simply as it implies, pour it on. Now, if you look at this very carefully, can you see how bubbly it is? All right. Now, this I'm going to tell you. I see, I've seen guys out here try to do this in one shot. Doesn't work, simply put. The best way to do it is to squeegee on one coat. Put it on relatively thin. Why? Well, in the case of like this mahogany piece of veneer, or on woods that's commonly, it's commonly, it's used on oak a lot for the restaurant industry and whatever. But the problem is, is that you've got air down in the wood. And that air is going to try to come out. And the first coat, a lot of times, you can get bubbles. Pretty common, very common. Don't freak out. 
because what you can do after you put the first coat on is kind of give it just a little bit of a light sand, break the bubbles, then hit it with a second one. Now here's what we've got. We've got a thin coat just about like we was putting on that grain filler. Except that we've got something in here that's going to be extremely, extremely tough. Now, on your edges, what you want to do is just simply take your little brush, or as they will tell you, when you're getting down to the finals, is just kind of let it run over. I always like to brush my edges good. Now I hope you got a little better edge than I'm showing you here, but nevertheless. Now once, assuming this is dried, then we just put it on. Level it out. Now some of this stuff can be built way up. Big, thick. Some of it will tell you you can go as much as a half inch. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you do. But you want to get a good coat. Again, I just like to trowel it out. Same plastic little squeegee. A as we did in the grain filling. Now this dries slow and it'll self-level to a big degree. You can use a brush to do it. Just make sure you don't get any loose brush hairs down in it. And just kind of level it out, let it, let it flow. It'll do that. If you get bubbles, and they're still coming up through it. Something as stupid as breathing on it. Do what? Yep, carbon dioxide. That's what you're breathing out. Bubbles will just disappear. Causes them to pop. Now once this is dried and flowed out, what do we do then? I can make a general mess with this stuff now. That'll work. All right. Let's come back and see what we can do with it. Here's a piece of, I, I grabbed a little corner of a piece of a burl veneer and I glued it on this piece of MDF just to show you. I didn't do too good a job of gluing it, but You'll have that. Anyway, and I put a couple coats of the port on. Now what I'm going to do, I've got a piece of 600 on a random orbit sander. This is a piece of the Abernet. Just as easily use a silicon carbide on a PSA. Works good. Now one of the things I like to do when I do this, now, what I would normally do would be to sand this back perfectly flat. Just get everything nice and level. Maybe put another coat on. Just a light thin coat, seal everything up, depending upon how much I had to do to level. Then I'm going to sand it. What I've got here is a little bit of water with some soap in it. <laughs> I sand everything till I'm good and smooth, flat and level. In the case here where I did this to show you, can you see right here, I got some dimples. Well, I could keep sanding or I could just put a little bit more on there, kind of spot fill them, let it dry, and I've got a uniform film. Nice, flat and level. Now, there's a couple things I can do here. 
If I'm going to use a water-based top coat on this, I'd probably put out a thin coat of shellac, just to be sure. But a solvent-based top coat, if I want to come back on top of this with just something like a regular lacquer, no problem. Whoops. If I wanted to take something like a gel finish, put a little bit on it. No problem. Different sheen, getting rid of the gloss. Because the problem with this stuff, where most people get in trouble, is they try to do a tabletop or something and they get little specks of dust or dirt and whatever in it, and they want that pristine. Well, what I'm showing you is you can sand it back. Now, the other thing that I can do is I can simply work this down. Let me get rid of this finish, show you that. Here's a 600. Excuse me, that's a 400. I can jump up to a 600. Whoops, wrong stuff. Now I can keep on moving up through this, moving up through my grits. I mean, I can buy the wet and dry stuff all the way up to 2,500. The higher I go in the grit, the smoother it's going to get. And the shinier it's going to get. That's how I can control what kind of sheen I get. Now, the other thing I can do, like this is a piece of what's called Abrolon. Abrolon is predominantly used in the solid surface industry. You know, Corian, granites, marbles. We discovered something. Hook and loop pad. This is a 2000 grit. Enough said. Moving up through those fine grits. You can actually treat it and work it just like you were a solid surface. Now see this 2000 is now doling down to a little bit of like a satin sheen. And that's just simply because this would just need a little bit more polishing because I jumped from a 600 and went straight to a 2000. That's a pretty good jump. But I can keep polishing and take it right on up to an absolutely pristine gloss surface. With that said, we're going to come back and we're going to look at rubbing out. Now the techniques we're going to use to rub out are exactly the same that we could use on this product. The only difference is, is that here we now have something that's just tenacious. And you know, you put down a veneer or you've got a big tabletop or something that you want to get the ultimate bar top or something. It's a, good, it's a good product to know about. And to know that you can sand it, work it over top of whatever you've got down, pretty cool. It can save you a lot of heartache sometimes. We're going to look at rubbing a finish out. Now I'm going to tell you, I do it a little bit different than most people tell you. And that has to do with the fact, I guess, that I did the auto body stuff for many years. 
and we rubbed a lot of finishes. Now, the traditional way is to use rotten stone and pumice and all of that. And that's okay. The problem with that is, is that when you get into your lower sheens, it's very difficult to rub something to a satin sheen or semi-gloss because the more you rub, the glossier the finish becomes. There's no constant in it. And so you wind up with shiny spots and you wind up with not so shiny spots and kind of the way it works. A satin sheen is pretty much the dominant sheen in woodworking. But anyway, the way I do it is I sand. I'm not a fan of steel wool either. And I'm going to show you why. To get a finish flat and level, you got to sand it. So common sense says if we can sand it and create a sheen at the same time, makes sense. Because unlike a pumice or a rotten stone or steel wool, a sand scratch is a consistent value. It constantly does pretty much the same thing. Meaning if you're using a 1200 grit sandpaper and you sand here at five strokes and you sand over here four strokes, you still got a 1200 grit scratch. Doesn't matter. And you have to understand that that sheen is controlled by a diffusion of light. If you take your ring to a jeweler and he buffs it, if you put it under a microscope, it's full of scratches. It's how fine those scratches are that determine our sheen. It's that simple. Let's look at this. Yeah, I know, I wrote the charts. Billy, can you see the bottom? Down here. A 600 to an 800, now I'm talking about a P grade. A 600 to an 800 is a flat sheen. An 800 to a 1200 is a satin sheen. 12 to 15 is a semi-gloss, and 1,500 to 2,500 is a gloss, and ranging in between there. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, what is he talking about? Let's take a look. Now, this is that door that we were brushing yesterday. We did it yesterday. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, this door is not dry enough, and that brings up a critical issue. Trying to rub finishes that are not dry is very, very difficult. Very difficult. You want to let them dry. This door should probably dry another two or three days. If it dried a week, that's even better. If it dried two weeks, that's even better yet. Because finishes shrink. As they cure and they dry, they shrink. Now, let me find my other chart here. And we'll see more of this later. Hard finishes rub better than soft finishes. Polyurethanes and urethanes are not soft, but we're referring to them as soft in this context. And the reason for that is they're rubbery. And rubbery is hard to rub to a sheen because it's made to resist a scratch. Acrylics are hard, phenolics are hard, urethanes are tough, flexible, a little harder to deal with. Some of the best rubbing are lacquers and shellacs, water-based acrylics, and all varnish and polyurethanes get tougher. Spar varnishes are very tough. Okay. But here's the premise of rubbing out. On this door, what I'm going to do is I've got a little bit of water, that same water with a little bit of soap in it. <coughs> right here, I've got a little block and I've got a piece of 1200 on it. <coughs> now, one of the things that a lot of guys like to do is just get on here with their hands and start sanding. Not a good idea. The reason for it is we're sanding. <clears throat> and even if you're using steel wool, 
rotten stone, pumice, anything, you're removing finish. If you're going to rub a finish, I always suggest to put an extra coat or two on and give yourself plenty of room to do it. And here's the problem. They get on here with their hand and their fingers are making ridges. <coughs> the other thing is, is that this paper, they're not careful that paper will fold over that little sharp edge and cut through. Here's the way I prefer it. I actually take a cork block. And what I do is I usually go to the craft store, buy me some cork, take me some, and glue it onto a piece of wood. Now, like rubbing in this edge of this raised panel, I'll actually take these blocks and cut them up till I've got something that will lay right in that edge. And you notice what I've done. I took a piece of 1200 PSA, stuck it to my cork, and I trimmed it so that I'm sanding exactly where I need to be. I don't want this paper ro rolling over. Now, just a little bit ago, we was talking about this Aberlon. It's a sponge with sandpaper on it. Works great. I keep little cutoffs. Now, here's one I've done that we'll see in a minute. I actually took, it sticks to a piece. I took a, a piece of wood, and I glued a piece of hook and loop to it, and I've got my Aberlon on it, and I've trimmed the edges. I take my little cutoffs, and I use them for just kind of polishing up my beads. What I'm after is to get an even, equal sheen. But the first thing I've got to do is usually there's a little dust and some nibs and stuff like that in it, and I want to get that out. That's where sanding works. I'll take some of this water with the soap, just a little bit of soap, and I'm going to sand this flat. or till it's smooth. Now unless you've got a perfect surface, I'm going to sand with the grain. And one of the reasons I want to sand with the grain is because it's going to help camouflage my scratches. Now in this case I'm using the 1200. If this was a little rougher, I might drop down to a 600 or an 800 or depending upon the sheen that we wanted. Same little squeegees. I can squeegee it off and see how well I've done. Once I'm satisfied that I'm flat and smooth, then I can simply take something like this Aberlon and rub it because it's cushiony and rub it till I have a consistent, even sheen, no shiny spots anywhere. Now, if you're proficient, if you're good, you can cheat. This is a 2000 grit. <laughs> Now that is a satin sheen. Now to enhance that a little bit, if I rub it with a little bit of water, it's going to be a little glossier. Now you can buy this Aberlon right on up into the, I think, four to six thousand. All right, now it's going to really, really buff it up. Then just something on here like a good wax. Now I'm going to tell you something about wax. A lot of people think wax adds a lot of protection. It don't. And a lot of people when they're waxing something they wet, they over wax it a lot. They put a ton. Thin coats. Now 
Now usually the biggest problem you have with wax is that this is one I like a lot because it dries almost instantly and it dries hard. It's purely an appearance thing. Put it on, buff it off. Now when it gets a little streaky on you, which it's going to do, and the reason it's going to do that is because normally it's, be it's, on, it's because we don't have the solvents having all evaporated. That has to do with that cure thing. You just saw what I did. I took a little water. The other thing is a lot of times you're rubbing so hard that the water, that you build up enough heat just from the rubbing that it will cloud your wax or, or make it redissolve and it's not completely hard. A little cool water keeps that from happening. And you have a satin sheen. Now, like I said, I can build this right on up. I can just keep right on going. The other thing I can do, if I want a super gloss. Now, there's two types of compounds. This is used in the automotive industry. One is a rubbing, it's a rough cut. The other is a polishing, it's a finer cut. Once I'm at this stage, now again, I can keep moving on up through my grits. Might help I open this thing, huh? Again, it doesn't take a lot. This is the polishing. To rub up to a gloss is easy. To rub up to anything other than, that's where it's tough. See, it don't take a lot to get a gloss. See it coming up? Want to cheat? Huh? Y'all really want to cheat? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Why do it by hand when you don't got it? Little product called Sure Buff. Ooh, that's a lot. That's almost too much. That is too much. Now you can wash these things out. You don't want a whole slew of it. Now, Right now, still got too much compound. Doesn't take a lot, a little squirt. I'm going to switch pads because I still got too much compound on there. Now these are washable. I, can go, I could go over to the sink and wash that out. Now 
here's another neat little product. In the automotive world, they call it a hand glaze. It's super fine. That's more like it. I usually actually take this and put it in a squirt bottle. <laughs> Glaze is kind of like a wax, doesn't have any silicones in it. And I could rub on just a little bit more. Now there's one thing I want to tell you about rubbing water base. If you're going to rub water base, make sure that you get your last coat before you put your final coat on it. You get it just as slick as you can. As we go through this, we're going to talk about evaporative finishes. That's your shellacs and lacquers. And when you put one coat on, it melts into the other and kind of becomes one uniform coat. Water bases sort of do that, but not to the extent the shellacs and uh, lacquers do. And when you go through one coat into the next, you can get a thing called ghosting and you'll see like a ring. And that's because while those two, co two separate coats are stuck together good and tight, they'll still show a little bit. So you want a good final coat and try to make sure you're just as smooth as you humanly can be before you put your final coat on so that all you're actually working is your top surface and you get a gloss finish. Now, if I wanted that finish less than that, see that's the problem with the compounds. Where do I start? Rotten stone pumice is just another form of a compound. I'm going to touch on this one more time. All right, I can simply take a, again, I just happen to have, now, there's all the silicon carbide is what you want to sand with. That's the black stuff for wet or dry. And as you can see, you can buy it in all kinds of different grits. Uh, here's some 2500. Okay. But again, I can take the Aberlon and come back and I can rub it back. Because all, right, all I'm creating is a scratch, and all the compound did was create a finer scratch. By rubbing this back, what I'm creating is that equal sheen. Now we've taken a gloss and taken it right back to a nice satin. Or kind of a semi-gloss here with this 2000. That's all the harder it is. The biggest keys is to play with it a little bit and to take your time. And when you're figuring out how you're going to be finishing your piece, include your rub out. Last thing I'm going to show you. When you get to the sanding one, I'm going to be telling you about rounding these corners. And don't be leaving sharp edges. And that little bit, you see right here on this corner? There's a rub through. Sharp super edges don't like to be rubbed. Last tip of the day. When you're doing something like this, an old finisher's trick be to take a little piece of tape and run along that edge and then just kind of hand touch it up after the fact. Particularly if I'm using something like the Aberlon that's larger than my sander and can roll over that edge, just be careful and you can make it any way you want it. 
As we showed you earlier and told you, the same thing applies to the pour-on finishes. Oil finishes you can do the same way. They're just much thinner, so go easy. That's rubbing out. What I've done is I've, I've taken some, some paint. This is just a water-based paint. This is a yellow, light yellow, and here's a kind of a gold or a umber color. Anyway, all I did was I put it on this piece of pine, just enough to get it some color. And what I'm doing now is I'm taking some water-based finish and I'm going to put a coat on it because I want to seal down my paint. Now, what we do after that is we're going to play here just a little bit with some faux finishes. What's faux? Well, it's spelled F-A-U-X. And it's French, I think, for false. Anyway, we're just going to make a general mess the way we're going to do it. Now, the reason I'm putting this coat of finish on here is we're going to be using some glazes and things to create a few little effects. Now, we're not going to get crazy with this because there's a lot of books out here. Here's the thing I want to show you is that by sealing this off, my coat of paint, then put down a clear finish, I could have just as easily used, you know, a one pound cut of shellac. Would have worked just great. All right, we're going to let this dry, and then we're going to see what we can do with it. Making a mess. I do it better than anybody you know. What I got here, this is an oil-based, heavy body glaze. Now, this is a Mohawk. In Mohawk, you'll also see they have a finisher's glaze. It's thinner. But because this is really thick, and trust me, it is, I put it, I put a little bit of mineral spirits in here, just enough to thin it to a soupy. Let's see how this does. Now, on, remember, I've got a coat of water base down here. Now, comes something you got to know. I scuffed this a little bit. I can put oil base over water base. I can't put water base over oil. The only way I can do that is put a barrier coat of shellac. Water and oil don't mix. Now I've got a rag right here damp with mineral spirits. Is that better, Billy? I got a rag damp with mineral spirits. Now this is kind of cool because it works really neat kind of like on MDF or really dead stuff. And I'm not going to show you all this stuff you can do. It's books out there, like I said, galore. But you can create some interesting burls. Piece of saran wrap. Now the other reason, you got to work kind of quick. This might, you know, I've got some, and depending upon how heavy you put your glaze, you can take and you can spread it out, a little crumpled up, kind of pat it on, snatch it off, you can ball it up, and you can just go stupid. Make some of the fun stuff. Now what would I do with that? I would let that dry really well. Okay, then I would come back over top of that with about a one pound cut of shellac. Seal it in. Glazes have to go over a finish. 
Hear that? Glazes have to go over a finish. They're not designed to go directly on top of a stain of paint. There has to be a barrier. The other cool thing about that is, and this is what I want, main thing I want to show you. As you're experimenting and playing, because this is an oil base, and because we have that barrier coat of water-based finish down, if you mess it up, you can start over. If you don't learn nothing but that, there you go. Now I got a water base. This is a Van Dyke Brown. Make sure I'm dry here or wet. Same thing. These are just some of my favorite little things to do. Like I said on MDF, man, you can, you know, there's nothing pretty about MDF. Now I got a rag damp with water. Now the cool thing about this, same thing, now I could let this dry, put another coat of shellac or water based finish on it, just something to seal it down, come back on top of that with another color, do it again, and just go hog wild. Down here in my neck of the woods, we call that going stupid. I ain't never done that. We're going to come back and look at one more. Paint. Kids and ladies just love it. Making weird looking granite or whatever type look you want. That layered thing. Here's a case where we put out a base of some light gray. Here we put out a base of red. Here we put out a base of a green. Started playing just different colors, layering one color over the next. Some only thing that was done with is something as simple as a little sea sponge. And again, any of your box stores are going to have all kind of stuff on techniques for doing this. Here's your hint. You want to make a crackle paint? Take you some high glue, you know the brown stuff you buy in the bottle? Thin it about 50-50 with water. Stir it up good. Paint whatever you want. After, put down a base coat of a water-based paint. Put the glue on it. Let it dry good. Then put another coat of latex paint over top of it. Don't sand in between the coats. The hard surface the glue leaves makes the paint dry at first, makes it crack. Take your hair dryer and kind of play with blowing it with a hair dryer, you can increase and decrease the size of the cracks. Then, put a little coat of finish on it, use a glaze, glaze over it, fills in the cracks. But just like this, I can take a glaze or a paint by changing my, you know, the amount I've got, my texture, I can completely change whatever I'm looking at. Here's your hint. Or if I don't like it, I can wipe it off. For doing your doing this, paints work best. I can take blacks subdue color, cool it. They cool it down. See up here where we've got the red and the white and the gray? Take a glaze and kind of dirty it. You subdue it. You cool it, tone it down. Take a little red, you brighten it. Now, what I was going to show you, you know, a lot of people, the little specks, making fly specks, we call it. Stiff brush, toothbrush or something, dip it in a glaze or a paint and just flick it. Want them a little heavier? Now here's where you can use one of them cheap brushes. Don't like it? 
Now this has got a coat of water-based finish on top. Could have been shellac just as well. You want to get crazy? Take your sponge, put your base down, whatever you want, play with colors, just regular. You can go to the hardware store or the box store and just get you some regular quartz house paint. You can go to the craft store and get you some little bottles of the water-based craft paint, just the little ones, pretty inexpensive, and play until you figure out a color scheme you want to work with. And you've all seen this out there. It's out there everywhere. Simply take a feather, load it up a little bit, you can create marble. One of the secrets to creating anything is try not to be real specific and real patterned. Make it look natural. You know, where you've got something like a green with a pink coming into a brighter blue, you know, <laughs> get stupid. And you can create all kind of different things with paint. Now here's another thing. You could sand this. You could put a coat of some water-based finish on top of it. You could put a coat of uh, solvent base on it. A gel finish. You wouldn't want to put an oil on here because it's sealed. But to fit, top this off, sand it down, get it smooth, a little smoother. Put your gel finish on it, clear gel top coat. Man, you're good to go. You can create some pretty nice stuff. Paint. It's not just for walls, guys. <laughs>